Um, let's welcome Tony Conrad and James Freeman. How's everybody doing? Great. Uh, any Blue Bottle Coffee fans in the audience? <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We've got the, uh, we've got the maestro here. Um, I'm super excited to be on stage with James. I'm super excited for him to tell you his story uh, around Blue Bottle Coffee. I think it's inspiring. Um, I think there's lots of nuggets of, um, of information that are helpful to founders and entrepreneurs. Um, and so let's get into it. Um, so James, uh, you know, the, the thing that when I first met you, I remember you telling me a little bit the story of how you started off as a clarinet musician and then you migrated into your first coffee um, foray. And I'm just, maybe you could help share the story a little bit about your background and how you got to this place. Yeah, um, I was a clarinet player, so I don't have a business background. And um, what you do when you're a clarinet player is you do the same thing in a room by yourself over and over again for thousands of times until you're good at it enough so that somebody will hire you. Um, it's not super social, and it's basically dwelling with your insufficiencies for sometimes decades. <laughs> and I was good enough to make a living, barely, and that's hard, but I wasn't quite good enough to get the jobs that I really wanted that's even harder. And I just, somewhere along the way, this, this, you know, this chemical, this wonderful substance, this, this um, thing that I would drink every day, many, many times in the day, started to like capture more of my imagination and my attention than clarinet did. And the nice thing about being desperate <laughs> and, and unhappy is like taking a leap of faith doesn't seem like so bad. <laughs> you know? And so I was roasting coffee on a perforated baking sheet at home, and when I would go on tours, I would take little parts of that with me. I was very excited. At the time in San Francisco, literally, you could not buy a bag of coffee with a roast date stamped on it. And this idea of coffee as being a fresh food, coffee as being something that had an arc, um, was, was fascinating to me, and, and I didn't see it anywhere else. This was before the internet was kind of methodically taking the joy out of these personal discoveries. And <laughs> so it, I, it felt very personal. It felt like um, I was the sole discoverer of this. And, and so that's, that's how it really started. I had a little bit of money. I didn't know it wasn't enough. So I, I opened it in 200 square foot former potting shed behind the restaurant Doña Tomas at 51st and Telegraph and, and started doing farmer's markets. Wow, that's amazing. So, um, you know, when you, so when you first did it, um, you're just doing it out of passion. You know, yes. Did you ever, I mean, today you're sitting on one of the iconic brands, certainly, to come out of the Bay Area. It's known no everywhere. Pressure. It's known everywhere. Um, but I'm just curious, like, w did you just think this was going to be kind of a little segue hobby, or was this something that, like, wow, this, I'm really going to, this is going to be my, my life? No, I, I mean, I've only... I'm lucky in a sense that I've only really wanted to do two things. Um, I meet people every once in a while that's like, uh, I, I need to find my passion. I need, I'm not sure what I should be doing. And, and it's hard for me to empathize with that because as soon as I left clarinet to go to coffee, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I knew that it was a big enough and rich enough subject matter that I could devote my whole life to getting better at it. And so it, in a way, that, that's kind of the luckiest part is I don't, I don't wonder what I should be doing. And what was your first experience with coffee? How old were you? Um, I was four, <laughs> and my parents drank U-Ban coffee in the, or no, 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 it was MJB. It was MJB. They, they upgraded to U-Ban when I was a teenager. Um, and it was in this pretty iconic green can, and they would let me open it when I got old enough to let me open the tin with the can opener and it was vacuum sealed and you'd hear that 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 um, gush of 
of aroma pour, pour out. And I, I just thought that was the greatest smell. I thought it was the greatest smell. And you know, you're four and it's like a, a can opener is sharp and dangerous. It's like a, a grown up <laughs> tool. So I felt very empowered. Um, and then, you know, and then there was the, this prolonged begging campaign of, of uh, when can I try this coffee? This thing that smells so good, I must try it. I must, must try that. And, you know, years went by, maybe uh, finally seven, eight years old, they relented and, and let me try it. And it was, you know, MJB coffee in a percolator. And it was horrible. It was just so terrible. And, you know, th this, uh, what do you call it? Ide fixe that I, that I had. And it just like, it was crushed in a moment of, of trying this horrible thing. Um, children are, are much more sensitive to, to bitter um, substances anyway. And James, you were four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I think that tension implanted something very deep. Had it been really delicious, it might not have, have embedded so, so deeply, I think. Um, but because of this, this tension between the great smell and, and the, the horrible, horrible taste, um, I, I think lodged more deeply than um, had it been a really great cup of coffee. That's awesome. I love that. I love that. I love that piece. Um, so when so when you started when you started in, you know I guess in the the farmers markets, um, take us through a little bit like what your mindset was and what you were going through and like I mean were you scared? Were you? I, I know you were excited, but were you also a little nervous and oh yeah trying to understand how this all squared up to like pay bills for an apartment and things like that? Yeah, fortunately my bills were very low and and my expectations in terms of financial performance as a clarinet player were very modest and that helps but also you know I I know now that some people in business like write checks basically that they can't cash they spend a lot of money that perhaps they shouldn't and I didn't know that that was possible when I started so I made sure I had to I had to make all this money before I, I spent it so that kept me running pretty frugally you know my initial rent was six hundred dollars and and I would buy coffee, and when I bought the coffee, I knew that I was going to be paid, I, the green coffee, unroasted coffee, that I was going to be able to, to pay for it. And, um, and so I, I progressed very slowly, but it was modest and methodical, and I was mostly concerned, you know, it was a relief that I, it seemed as though I was going to be able to pay my modest expenses, but I was mostly concerned about this product, that figuring out more about this product, how to make it more delicious, how to serve it in a way that was more delicious and appealing. So it was very much a product focus that I have had then and I have now that it's about this product. It's not about a brand or a business or a culture. You know, there's a lot of code words that get um, thrown around in business, but it's about this delicious thing and, and we have to ultimately respect this delicious thing more than anything else and, and that, any rewards that come will, will fall from that delicious thing. So, so tell us a little bit more about that. So you must have had some piece. I know you're. Um, I, I know you're a big fan of Japanese coffee. Yes. Um, and at that stage, was that already part of your knowledge base, and was, or is that something you were acquiring in parallel? That was definitely in parallel. I knew that I didn't like coffee in urns. I didn't like the way coffee in urns tasted, and I didn't like the symbolism of it. I didn't like this idea that coffee is easy, that coffee takes 20 seconds and there you go and maybe you don't think about it. Maybe if it doesn't taste the way you like it, you dump a bunch of milk and sugar in it. I didn't like that idea and so we've never made coffee in urns and even from the farmer's market, I would get little cones and, and pour um, hot water over it. And it started in a kind of a more rustic way based on um, what I knew from Monmouth Coffee in London and then I ha had the good fortune to run into this gentleman, uh, Jay Igami, who worked at a, a Japanese coffee company. He, he was based in San Francisco. He, and he just came over one time at the farmer's market, had a cappuccino, paid for it, and, and started coming to my roastery. And, and he was my pipeline to Japanese coffee techniques and thoughts and culture. Um, this, this culture of you know, repetition and mastery I think is more deeply embedded in a lot of Japanese industries. 
So that was very fascinating to me, and it, it, he felt like a kindred spirit. And then he became my introduction. He would, you know, about 2006, he brought this kettle with this fine spout, and he's like, oh, you'll have more control over the water if you, if you pour from this kettle. And it's like, well, you're right. And then, you know, it, it went on from there. I went to Japan in 2007 um, for the second time. The first time I went as a teenager with a musical group. And um, this, that second time in 2007, right before we opened our shop in Mint Plaza, it just like blew my mind, this dedication and meticulousness. And, and that's where the seeds were really embedded. Uh -huh. and, and was that the most exciting moment? for you in like coffee discovery where it like unlocks something, some potential? Yes, I mean definitely like this idea of mastery and technique, it's like, oh, that's totally what I've been thinking about since I was 12 years old, you know, and just being able to transfer that skill set of repetition and technique and not really questioning, like when they said at UCC, like, oh, you should pour clockwise and not counterclockwise. I'm I didn't say why, I just said, yes, clockwise, I will pour it clockwise. And, and just being willing to learn and put myself in a non-skeptical place with all that, I think has been really helpful. So um, I'm sure a lot of people relate to this in the room, but you know, as a founder, there are moments where, uh, you know, what, starting a business is a little crazy, right? If you kind of really penciled it out, you would never do it. No, no. Um, <laughs> um, and then you're doing it, and there are moments uh, in that beginning where you look back, if you've had success or, or failure, um, and you go, wow, that was the cra crazy leap of faith moment. That's where I really just kind of like, I, I, I went nuts. Um, where was that for you in those early days? I think there's been a lot of leaps <laughs> of faith. Um, it's hard to, I mean, definitely getting into the ferry building on Saturday morning, that was a real education for me. I still wake up sometimes if it's rainy on a Saturday morning and it's pouring rain and it's 4.30 and it's dark. I, I still think sometimes, oh, man, the load-in is going to be so arduous this morning. And then I realize, <laughs> oh, I don't have to do the load-in. There's a whole <laughs> farmer's market crew that is doing the load-in right now. And so it's, like, it's very deeply embedded, that, that just that real, that work. And like every single drink, would, there was, it seemed like there was so much riding on it every Saturday. And, and there was a time when the Saturday at the Ferry Plaza was 50% of our company's revenue. Um, and that, and I, I, you know, that it was just like so fraught and so meaningful. Anytime somebody forgot something, anytime, you know, I, something didn't come out exactly the way I wanted it to, it, it, it was just like I so deeply felt. I, I still I think that Saturday at the Ferry Plaza Farmer's Market has taught me perhaps more than anything else. And um, in your first day back to the Oakland Farmer's Market, how much coffee did you sell? 12 pounds. <laughs> I wanted to sell more. My goal was 20. And I heard, Pete's, 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 Pete's. That's all anybody wanted to talk to me about. Is it as dark as Pete's? No. And then off they go. <laughs> you know. Um, but, uh, you know, 12 people. I still remember Tom Donnelly and Cheryl Loring bought coffee that first day. And I still see Tom at the roastery up the street. So you remember your early regulars, that's for sure. That's amazing. And then when you went to Linden Street, uh, um, tell us a little bit about that and how that came about. Because I think that was the yeah, first. That was our first seven day a week. Detail. Yeah, we opened January 23rd, 2005. And um, Do, how many people know the Linden Street uh, in San Francisco? It's the little one in the garage in Hayes Valley. It, it's a cute little spot, a little unlikely. Um, it's amazing. Oh, good. I'm glad you like it, Tony. Um, yeah, that was a, I, I knew the guy who owned the building. He was a great guy, Loring Sagan, who's architect. And, and he's like, well, I've got this cool building. It's, in, it's on an alleyway. It was, it, at the time, it was a dead-end alleyway that smelled like pee and um, kind of unsavory. But it, it was, I didn't have to build out a whole cafe. We could figure out how to put a little kiosk, which has a very different regulatory environment than a cafe. So it was um, affordable. And so we opened, and I, I thought either two things would happen. One, we would make really good coffee. Nobody would come. We'd have an amazing six months of making good coffee to very few people, and then we'd have to shut it down. And I was kind of fine with that. I was fine, like, b 
being some sort of dimly recalled coffee legend. Remember that cool cart? <laughs> I wonder what, those guys were really good, but it was crazy to open in a garage in an alleyway. Um, so either that would happen or it would progress and, and more and more people would come. And um, that fortunately, the second one happened. Uh, I would have been fine with either one, but the second one happened and now it's, it's a little machine. We make a lot of coffee. At the time, it was the first PID controlled La Marzocco that was in California. It was the, one of the very few places that were pulling sort of short timed shots that was that every drink would with milk had a, was beautiful and steamed appropriately that was steamed to order. Every coffee was made, ground and made to order. So it was an odd little thing that happened. Do you, do you remember how, many, um, how much coffee you sold the first day? First day, or how you know in dollars? Like yeah, first day was about four hundred dollars, and then it kind of went down. The weather got worse, <laughs> and Arno, who's our head of production for all of Blue Bottle, he was the second barista I ever hired, and he was working there, and he would call me. I remember him calling me. He's like, "Ah, oh, we made two hundred and sixty dollars today, James. I don't know." And it's like, I kind of agreed with him about this uncertainty, but I had to, had to like put a brave face on it. It's like, all right, just uh, let's. Just get out there, make good coffee. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. And so far, it's been all right. That's amazing. So, um, and in that coffee shop, is is can you tell us a little bit about one of the coffee drinks, the Gibraltar, and how oh, that, right. that came about? It's funny. It's a funny little thing that happens. Um, we had these cups. The, one of our employees bought these cups that were too small to cup coffee, which is sort of a quality control regimen that happens. And I was a little mad because, you know, every $7 mattered, still matters. Um, I was, but we started using those cups to do our testing at the kiosks because they, you could see through them and you could see like the layer of crema and the layer of espresso. And, and so the ladies from the corset store next door started coming over when we were testing and wanting coffee and espresso was too strong. And so we would pour a little milk in it and give it to them. And then when we opened for real, they would come over and they wanted that thing in the little cute little cup that they used to get. And so we'd give it to them and then customers would say, what is that drink? I want that. And um, the trade name on the box is Libby Company Gibraltar Glass. And so one of our baristas sort of smirkily said, oh, that's our Gibraltar. Snicker, snicker, snicker. Not thinking that a few years later that drink within that glass is going to show up in London or Tokyo or New York or you know a, any of a, a hundred places across the United States so it's one of those funny that's amazing yeah all right so let's fast forward a little bit um, so you're you know you kind of you, you start with this uh, beautiful passion around uh, the product um, I think you also have a lot of philosophies around uh, keeping it simple and how the beans are sourced and all that. Can you share a little bit of that with us? And then I want to move forward into current state and kind of, yeah. you know, this this mega empire that you, you have. It's a modest mega empire. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't like a lot of extra stuff. So our first, you know, our menus, when we open the kiosk, if, if you would, like, I read things about business every so often and, you're supposed to like do your market research, right? And, and had I done the appropriate market research, I would have asked questions like, oh, do you want fewer choices in drinks? Do you want fewer choices in sizes of drinks? Do you want smaller portion sizes? Do you want it to cost a little bit more than you're used to? Do you want the beans to be roasted lighter than you say you like? And, and I would have gotten this litany of no, 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 no. Um, yeah, that seems to be what people wanted so that tension between what people say they want and what people actually want I think is very relevant and interesting to me um, and so that's been part of our growth whenever we do this I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about how to please our guests but I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what somebody might want I'm trying to think about what somebody might not realize they want and be so excited when they finally get it um, so there's a fair amount of that as we um, progress, as we have progressed. And then just this like idea of stripping things down. Um, uh, St. Francis, uh, my favorite saint, uh, was supposedly said, um, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. And I love that clause, if necessary. Um, so I don't like to, 
have too much chatter in our shops, too much visual clutter, too many words. Um, just enough is important to me. That's Did great. that answer your question? Uh, kind of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's kind of move forward. So you, you've now, um, as everybody knows, you, you've you raised um, some capital. Yes, I have. Thank you, Tony. Um, and, and many others. <coughs> um, <laughs> I know I can really drill him right now. Yeah. I can ask all the questions that I really want to ask. Um, but uh, so tell us a little bit about, I mean, th th that's that's a different thing probably than what you thought in 2002. You'd be sitting here in 2012 you know, or 13 and raising millions of dollars of capital and whatnot. What's, what's that like and why did you do it? Well, I, I realized that there, we had this thing, this, that people valued and, and seemed, there seemed to be a lot of inexplicable momentum behind it. Um, this thing is primarily centered around a product and a love of a product and a, and a dedication to a meticulous execution of a product. Um, and as we progress in this thing, it, why not get it into the hands of more people that want it? Um, and you know, just my lessons, my brutal lessons with the SBA loan that I got at Mint Plaza, like that's not so easy either. Um, so the the fact that there are people like Tony who understand business and and understand sort of this the cryptography of of what people want in a way that, that I never have. I, I understand what I want very deeply and I'm aligned with a lot of our customers, not all of them, but a lot of them. But um, the fact that there are so many smart people that are interested in what we're doing at Blue Bottle and want to help us propel it forward and the fact that Tony and the rest of our invent investors, they don't want to be the guy that messed Blue Bottle up. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's a powerful position too. It's always better to find investors when you don't need them. It's always easier. And so there was a little bit of that working in our favor. I could choose to work with whom I wanted to choose. And I feel very lucky that I chose well. Um, but yeah, it, it's, a very, it's a very different environment. I have to be a little more careful with making decisions because they, they resonate over a larger period of, of geography and they affect more people. Our last paycheck run was 295 people. That's a lot of responsibility, a responsibility I never thought I'd have. And you know, it's important to make correct decisions and correct dis a scale sometimes are harder and, and a little more, I don't want to use the term ruthless, but sometimes that what, that's what it feels like. I have to be more protective of what we've created. And sometimes that means telling people things they don't want to hear. And so that's been the biggest change, I think. So, um, you know, I think as a lot of people in the room are aware, there's, you know, so especially in the technology sector, some of the um, probably most well-known technology founders in the world um, have lined up to support your vision and what you want to go do at Blue Bottle. Um, but there are a lot of people involved. Yes, um, not just tech. Investors. Yeah, and I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the people outside of tech um, who are who are involved and have supported you along the way and what that means. Yeah, well, I think one of the um, most important, Brian Meehan, came in as a lead investor in October of 2012, and he comes from a background in grocery stores and beauty products. He just really loves retail and is really good at retail, and he had such an infectious enthusiasm for Blue Bottle. He sent me this email, and I used to get a lot of emails like that, but his was so nice and charming, I met with him, and that was, just here's this great guy and he and I think very similar things and he can rally around people he knows to develop, to get this great group together. That's great. Um, yeah, and Brian, Brian is amazing, yeah. amazing uh, founder and, and uh, investor. Um, so let's talk about what your plans are for, you know, we're sitting here in 2014. Uh, yes. There's a lot of stuff already. happening. Uh, I think most of it's leaked into the press in the uh, general consciousness of the public, um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, Japan and, and other LA coming yeah. up, and also the, um, the new ready to drink product. Yes, I'm very excited about that. Well, we're opening in Tokyo, we're opening in Los Angeles, we're expanding in New York, expanding in the Bay Area, 
Um, all of those with the idea of keeping a roaster in each market. The roaster acts as the hub and the HQ. These are, this is where coffee is made. And so all of our staff has direct access to the roasting and QCing of our coffee in every market. I think that's very powerful and very important. Um, there's this thing, this ready to drink thing, and it's really delicious. And we spent about three years working on it. And it's just as good as the New Orleans style iced coffee we're selling in our shops, yet you can get it at Whole Foods now in an adorable little carton. You can get it in our shops too. And that's like, why not? If we can make it delicious, why not have more people, get more people to access it? I think we're gonna sell over 20,000 of those little cartons just in this region this week. And if we were Woo. gonna try to, <laughs> thank you, to try to make 20,000 extra lattes this week, that would be really hard. That would be a really, really long line. Um, so it's exciting. Just these things that start with, I was on a Virgin flight years ago and I got this ready to drink coffee and it was so horrible. And it, I was thinking like, well, why is the acceptable range of these drinks? The only range we have is from terrible to horrible. Why is that? And I learned that it's, it's much easier to make a horrible drink. Um, and, but you know, nobody sets out to do it. So this, I'm very excited. I think there's a lot of potential for that. Great. I think we're out of time. I'm not sure if uh, you want us to take a question, one question maybe? A couple questions uh, for the group. Don't be shy. This Whoever is asks a question gets a patch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about comparing Oakland to San Francisco, and I love Blue Bottle, by the way, and it's great you're out of Oakland. Um, and all the markets you mentioned are pretty high-end markets. I'm wondering what your approach is in the lines in San Francisco and the whole notion of San Francisco being this technorati, people lining up trying to stop the Google buses and you're overpriced, you're spending for $10 bottles of water, $12 bottles of coffee. How do you dispel that? Coming from Oakland, and we're talking about half the price of living over here, you seem to be more of a pitch towards the San Francisco you know, tech emerging tech crowd. So how, do you, how does your brand help get over that notion of you're only for elitist people who can afford you? Well, I think coffee falls under people. There's a lot of people think that coffee shouldn't be more expensive than X. I can get it at a diner for a dollar. Why would I pay four dollars for this um, Ethiopian Yirgacheff Galena Baya that Tony is sipping on quite happily? Um, the nice thing is we started in 2002. I wasn't thinking about tech. I wasn't thinking about exclusivity. I was thinking about excellence. So as it happens, there are a lot of people in certain industries that um, like to drink coffee, but there's a lot of firemen and a lot of policemen that like to drink our coffee too. So I think if we concern ourselves with excellence and not with symbolism, then that's the proper course of action to take. You know, it, I look, I live near Alamo Square in San Francisco and I see the lineup for the Google buses and I see those, you know, younger engineers waiting for their Google bus. And I look at them and it's like, well, they don't look like my enemy. They don't look like my neighbor's enemy. You know, some of them want to come into our shop, some of them don't, and that's fine. And, and, and I think there's a lot of people that come into our shops and it's easy. It's sort of in this sort of frothy environment. It's easy to look for symbols, but sometimes these symbols don't really stand for anything substantial. Hey James, um, I'm kind of curious how you tackle other coffee companies that kind of devalue coffee or um, make it instant or make it um, just bring the price of the perception of coffee really down. How do you deal with that from a market sense? I was, are you um, sneakily alluding to K-cups and Nespresso and stuff oh, like I, that? Oh, I, I try not to, but. Okay, very, me. very sneaky. Um, yeah. I would love it if you could put like a capsule in a machine and press a button and have something be so delicious. I would love that. That would be amazing. But it's just hard. Good things tend to be harder work than others. I think K-Cup is an interesting example because it's so popular. It's mind-bogglingly popular. And, and that's telling me something about some people, people that you think would know better, love that convenience and that cleanliness and it's just not about like George Clooney selling Nespresso machines. There, there's something that can be learned. I don't know what that thing is. There's something that can be learned 
from this desire that people have to make s- something easy. And, and it, it's like an approximation of an experience that they're having. They, K-Cup sells, or Nespresso better, sells the idea of this exclusivity in a cafe. And then they, they take it, it's like photocopying a photocopy until you still have this idea of what the original was like, but it's such an approximation that you're not getting anywhere close to the original information. I think they're kind of geniuses at, um, at the human capacity for self-deception, um, but I, I do think there is something that we could learn from in the coffee industry about making things easier. I don't know what that is yet. Is that it? One more? One more right here. James, I found it really interesting that you're a clarinet player. Uh, Tim Westergren is a, a pianist, a very accomplished pianist over at Pandora. Um, uh-huh. We heard MC Hammer talk about music and entrepreneurship. And uh, Do you connect the two in your mind, and, and how do you connect them? Um, I, do, I do. I mean, it, a, a beautiful coffee is about this idea of transcendence. It's about these things that are eternal. I was listening to Schoenberg's Girl Leader in the way over in my car, crank. And, um, and it, it's just this idea of inspiration and, and transcendence that can be very complex, a, you know, 150 person orchestra in a concert hall that you spend $200 to get a ticket to, or um, it can be something that's $3 that is, it, so perfectly crafted and so delicious and so much what you wanted at the moment that you wanted it that it can transcend other things and and the clutter of your mind and 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 just everything falls away for a few moments and so i i think it's this 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 fleeting transcendent uh, transcendence that is what i'm hoping for in coffee i can't get it all the time i can't give it all the time but i hope for it and i think that's what i was hoping for in clarinet only i got it far, far, far less often. Thank you.